Well, if you would have heard the hallelujah chorus that I heard just about an hour ago in the choir practice up here, you'd have been a little more excited. It was pretty good. So how are you doing this evening? She had it. She knew what to say. She had it. You know what? It's good to see you too this evening. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord on the Lord's day with the Lord's people. Amen. Amen. Tonight, if you would uh, go ahead and turn with me to Psalm chapter 8, we're going to continue on our discipleship study tonight. And I, I want us to see what God has to say about it as far as the extent of it is concerned because when we think about church again the image that pops into our head sometimes is a building and you know what I'm glad we've got good facilities but discipleship or what builds the church on the power of the Holy Spirit that is more than a building this is a, the, the buildings are resource the buildings are resource uh, if you are at uh, Psalm chapter 8 if uh, you'd please stand tonight for the reading of God's Word we're gonna start in verse 1 Psalm chapter 8 verse 1 O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendors above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you've established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the, the, moons and the, the, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you've made him a little lower than God or the angels. And you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes through the paths of the sea. Verse 9, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You may be seated. Lord, right, right now, we dedicate the reading of your word yet again. Lord, as was shared this morning, it's not repetition. Lord, this is reinforcement. Being reminded, just like gathering around your table for communion, being reminded that you are powerful, you are mighty, and we confess to you the times that we've stereotyped you. We've put you in a box. We've limited you based on our limited experience. You're creator of all things. You call us to share your caring attitude and to be in awe of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, maybe you get a little anxious <coughs> when you hear terms like church outside of the walls. Or, or, or you, you hear... Uh, titles to messages like tonight's more than a building <laughs> you think where are we going with this because church is sacred the time we have together here is sacred it's important and maybe you're thinking oh don't don't jeopardize that don't make it sound like church isn't really worth anything well okay you want the disclaimer scripture has a disclaimer that there were warnings against those who forsook the assembling of themselves together okay the scripture already gives a disclaimer we are expected to gather together, but there is more to it than that, in addition to, not in place of. And I believe that's one of the, one of the many crises the church faces today, is there was this mentality, an awakening, if you will, saying, hey, it's good that we gather together. Now, what else are we doing to reach out and help the poor, to spread the gospel to people who don't come in the church buildings? And some movements got started. Some of them as, as a part of the emergent church movement kind of sprung up that started saying, okay, in place of gathering, we'll reach out. And there's a, there's a fine line to, to work with there. We're still expected to gather. Now, what we do in addition to that, what we do that is more than a building, is built on this truth. When you think discipleship, think relationships. Uh, you know, there's some disagreement. What exactly is discipleship here? When you say that, is it just coming to church and, and sitting in a pew, singing the songs and hearing the message, making a decision, hearing the invitation and going home? 
Okay, that, that's going to be an element of discipleship, that teaching and preaching. But listen to this. The discipleship that Jesus demonstrated was living with these guys day in and day out, struggling with them, hearing their questions, both their wise and interrogating questions and kind of some of their stupid, foolish questions. Now you say, Mike, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Yeah, you want to bet? And when I say you want to bet, that's because God word, God's Word gives so many answers and there are so many people in and out of the church that are looking for ways out of those answers. So they ask what I tell my kids are foolish questions. Okay, foolish questions. Like today, uh, when we went out with our friends and, and we grabbed a bite to eat and we order water for everybody. And each time, Daniel wants another drink. It's Sprite or apple juice. And he takes a drink of his water and turns to me and says, Dad, can you get me Sprite? I said, Daniel, that's a foolish question because every time we go out to eat, I tell you we're getting water, and if I'm going to get you a treat, it'll be a surprise. And so he waited, and then Rebecca said, Hey, Dad, can we get Sprite? I said, Rebecca, you just heard what I told Daniel. And before I could finish talking to her, David but dad, I want Sprite. And it turned into a traumatic, it, it was over quickly because then the pancakes came and David was okay. <laughs> but it was a foolish question. They already knew the answer. It was a foolish question. Now they're kids. I mean, they, you know, they get some room there. But for adults, we should know better. And yet, discipleship, discipleship is about answering these questions and calling them out when it's a foolish question. Because in discipleship, one of the ways we get it messy is whenever we forget about the splendor and majesty of God we just read about and these simple truths that are made known even through the mouths of little children. And we try to get lost in these complex questions and try and twist God's word around and we want to find answers convenient to us instead of remembering some of the basic yet truthful Sunday school answers. And, and we're afraid to call people out on it and say, that's a foolish question. We're afraid it will hurt their feelings. I don't see anywhere where Jesus was too worried about hurting the disciples' feelings when he was with them. He reached out to them in love, and they knew he loved them. He earned that respect. That's part of building relationships. It's messy. Discipleship is messy. It's more than just coming here. This is intentionally spending time with someone, prioritizing it on your calendar and saying, hey, let's talk this week. There's an issue. Rather than talking to other people about that issue, it's going to this person and saying, hey, I hear you're, you're talking about that you, you did this on, on the weekend, and I just I want to talk to you about it because I've got a concern. Hear their story. That'll eliminate 90% of the rumors or gossip that you're hearing, and work on some discipleship with them and say, okay, well, sounds like everything's fine, or okay, the reason I'm coming to you, and it sounds like you did what I heard you did, and I want to talk to you one-on-one -on -one just to say, the reason it bothered me is because, and have that passage of Scripture ready, not a verse out of context, but have this teaching ready that says, this is what Jesus Christ taught that we should or shouldn't do. So, I want to share this with you, and I want to help hold you accountable. And they may reject you, and Jesus warned that would happen, and say, that's none of your business. When as a church, as part of discipleship is making the other person's business our business in a good way. And that doesn't mean sharing that information. That, is, that does not include gossip. That is excluded. But it means working with each other, spending time with each other. And that's what we don't want to do. We don't want to pull out our little calendar and go, well, now I've heard about this and I need to talk to this person. And that means going through your calendar and saying, I'm willing to commit to this time on the calendar to meet with you, even if it's for an hour, for 30 minutes and talk. That's what we struggle with right now in 2016. I'm going to come talk to you. You know, people expect that I'm going to do that. And I like to think I follow up with what I need to do here. But what about when the congregation continues doing that, growing in that, meeting with each other and talking to each other, holding each other accountable in love, and not over petty, silly things, but over things that you see in God's Word that are commands and directives that people are obeying. Discipleship goes outside these walls. When you look at Psalm chapter 8, it backs up the camera. It backs us all the way. We get, we get hyper-focused on our little church. I don't care if we had a thousand people in here. We get, we get focused on our little church. And meanwhile, 
God is way out here saying, how do you fit into my story? We get focused on who said what here, and, and is this going to happen at the right time here? And I'm, I'm confessing here. I get caught up in it too. But discipleship is more than just this building. It is us following God's story and His majesty and His splendor and sharing that with people. Are we doing that? I mean, we're called to go make disciples and to teach and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not being hypothetical right now, and I'm not asking for you to raise your hand and give examples. I want you to think of who you're discipling right now. Not an option. You don't get any bonus points for this. This is expected. Because with discipleship, there'll be growth. Discipleship doesn't mean that one person you've been working on for 12 years. Although those are some hard cases, and you, you stay in prayer for them. You trust that God will still change their heart. But a disciple is someone who is actively following. So if you have someone that you're reaching out to, keep reaching out to them, keep praying for them. But God said, he makes it clear, invest into someone who's learning. They're out there. They're out there. Who are you discipling right now? Who are you taking time with to break down the Word of God and to learn the Word of God together and to grow? Who are you doing that with? I want you to think about a specific person, a specific name. I'm not asking for you to write it down right now. I'm not asking for you to tell me who it is. I'm saying back up for a second and see the God of this great universe who is so majestic and then start zooming back in on his story and you realize that the least we can do is tell people about him. And I'm asking you, who are you telling about this wonderful God we serve? It's more than a building. The church and discipleship is more than a building. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. I'm afraid what we've done at times, and we collectively, all of us as a team, we did this together. We expect God to work in our little definitions and what, and what we do in our limited experience. And he works in much broader and bigger ways than that sometimes. Now, he will work within the context of his promises. But sometimes we don't know what that looks like. Sometimes we interpret the scripture to our own convenience and experience rather than being willing to consider that sometimes God's ways are not our ways. Now, he will not contradict himself. He will not contradict himself in his word. I'm afraid sometimes we've interpreted his word to our own convenience. Ephesians chapter 3, look with me at verse 14. This is the Apostle Paul speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now I love this part, verse 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly, beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And we build our buildings and we have our programs and we just had one tonight that we're practicing for and we, and we have our times for our worship services and we've got our little structures and what we'll do and what we won't do in our church. But remember, God can also work outside some of those things. It's more than the building we've built. And I say we, I'm a part of the family. I know I wasn't here when this was all constructed. But I'm a part of the family here. It's more than the buildings we build or any improvements we'll ever make. It's about the relationships. When you think discipleship, think relationship. Because when we think discipleship and we just think of lectures, that's not necessarily all that Christ did. That was a part of it. He did lecture and he did teach. 
And he broke down the Old Testament. And the, on the road to Emmaus, he said, all right. He said he started with all the scriptures and, and all the laws and prophets and expounded to them, expounded to them how he was a fulfillment of those things and how he was in those things. He, he taught, he lectured, but it was more than that. He was with them for what we would call teaching moments. Right? How many of you ever, how many of you were a teaching moment parent that you really, uh, you were one who could uh, get creative and find teaching moments for your kids? How many of you are teaching moment parents? Did you ever intentionally do that? Like, hey, this is a teaching moment or you were just like, well, tough luck. I hope you learn better next time. I can't say my parents were necessarily pull me aside teaching moment parents. I've met some, you know. They would teach us, but uh, Jesus was a teaching moment kind of guy. He would be there and he would see figs, a fig tree, make it a teaching moment. He would take a comment from accusers and turn it into a command or a prohibition. He would take advantage, he would seize an opportunity and make it a teaching moment. Those kind of opportunities happen outside this building. Now, you know, I can, I can be up in my office and studying the Scripture and doing all my background research and praying and looking at these other texts in Scripture, and I can come up here and I can have my little illustrations and I can have my little stories and I can create, with God's help, I can create a message and we have a, a, a teaching moment that happens sometime between 11.15 and 12 o'clock on Sunday morning. And, and that's important, and we need to gather together to hear. That's, that's, not, that's not an option. We've got to gather together to hear the teaching of God's Word and for the fellowship of the believers. But what about those teaching moments that happen outside of a pulpit? Who are you discipling? I've already asked you this earlier. And what kind of teaching moments do you maybe have that you haven't used? Situations are going through in their life. Maybe something you share in common with this person. Maybe an event you guys do together. Who knows? Whatever it is. Are, is there a teaching moment maybe you're missing? Jesus wouldn't miss it, but uh, we do sometimes. We miss the teaching moments because we're uncomfortable. Discipleship happens outside the building. Yes, it happens in here, but we've got to look for those teaching moments outside. Now you think, well, it's easy. You know, obviously, you know, well, I'm a pastor, so it's easy to find. Not necessarily. You know, there's those moments where I just, I just kind of want to check out for a couple hours and just, just kind of zone out on life for a little bit, and then the Lord will bring someone across my path. Inevitably, it's whenever I'm checking out at a cash register, there's somebody in line behind me. Oh, hey, how are you doing? Oh, good. And something in their cart or something they say, I know the Lord prompts me. This is a teaching moment. Not to start in a message, but just a simple statement of encouragement of who God is and His goodness and His love and His availability for salvation. Because we talk about discipleship and it's easy to leave it here in the church, but it's more than a building. It's out there. We've got to zoom back out and see this. So I'm asking you, are there teaching opportunities maybe you already know you have missed and can you go back maybe to these people you're discipling? And if you don't have someone that's popping into your head right now, then pray that the Lord will bring someone into your path to disciple because it's what you're called to do. And, and I'll be honest with you, what I do here, whenever I speak, I don't personally see this as the fulfillment for my discipleship calling. I see this as a fulfillment for my calling to preach the Word of God and then the discipleship continues throughout the week. And, and you know, now, I, I've got an easy one for you. I've got an easy one for you. For your parents, who's on the top of your list, priority-wise, to disciple? Your children. Your children. You've already got little disciples. Maybe little hellions, but they're little disciples. For you parents who have children, who are adults, have lives of their own, and they moved on, but they've perhaps moved away from the Lord... That's still a challenge for you to disciple. You say, well, it's not my place. All right, I'm a, I'm a parent, okay? We are told, and if you want to talk about orders here, we get orders even here in the book of Ephesians for the structure of a godly family. There's an expectation that the mother and father will be the leaders in discipleship. 
But you know what? Sometimes they won't listen to the parents, and you pray that God will bring along someone else who will walk with them. But it's still a responsibility of a parent. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 now. Okay, discipleship, this is a relationship. It can get messy. It can be sticky. We need to look for those teaching opportunities outside the walls. We've got to keep thinking outside, including what we do already. This is not in place of what we do. It is in addition to what we do. How much impact? I just want you to think with me for a second. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be starting in verse 14. Bottom line is, as a pastor, as a preacher, people expect me. They just expect me to share some of these things, and I will. That doesn't stop me. People expect me to invite people to church, and I do. Unless they're driving a Ford or a Dodge. Just kidding, I'm just kidding. People expect me to, me to do things. Oh, I, okay. Why is that still on there? I thought that was going to... Kurt, right now, back. He needs some discipleship. That's right, Kurt needs some discipleship. Yes, yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look, look there at verse 14. Uh, but I want you to think real quick before we read that. What would happen to this church if even just a family unit, not even individual at a time, but if a family unit took on the discipleship of another family unit. Maybe you've already got that situation. Maybe you've already got a family you're fellowshipping with, you're reaching out to, you're doing nice things for, you've told about the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. What would it be like if family on family were bringing families into this church? Because, you know, sometimes when you're a visitor, you come into a church and you're wearing what we call the critical cap. And you're more, is this comfortable for me? Is the music what I like? Is the order of service what I like? Is the preaching style what I like? Is, and it's about me. It's this critical cap that's very self-centered. When family invites family and there's already a relationship, maybe things aren't necessarily the way you prefer it, but it's family. You love the fellowship. You love the family. And you're ready to grow with the family because things like uh, th these different styles of preaching or music or orders of service, these things kind of ebb and flow and fluctuate with time, okay? What grows and bonds together is the family. United to care. That's what the church is for. That's what discipleship is about, is unifying together to care about each other. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, well, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, then I'm not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members but one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, verse 22, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on those we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there be no divisions in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, now you are Christ's body individually and members of it. The body that we're a part of is bigger than a building. I want you to imagine that on all your shirts, uh, you know, all your, all your clothes, your dress, your blouse, your shirt, whatever you have on, 
Imagine there's an embroidery there that says Center Christian Church. I actually have a couple of shirts. Justin, they give me a couple of shirts. I like to wear those. Every piece of clothing you had clearly, whether it's a jacket, a coat, whatever you put on on the outside, there was a clear label of our church family. Would that impact what you purchase? They say, Mike, I prefer the one where, you know, I just know God's there. Well, yeah, but sometimes it's easy to stand and go, I know God's watching, but he understands me. But there's something different that happens with church. It's a, a very practical and raw way to keep us accountable. What would happen if you're wearing that? Would you say some of the things you've been saying? Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. I don't know. I'm just asking. Maybe you're already at peace with what you're doing in Scripture, and you're going, well, this is fine. Some people in the church may disagree with what I do, but I know biblically I'm, I'm right in doing what I'm doing, and I'm not causing a brother or sister to stumble. I'm, I'm okay with my choices here. Okay, well, that's between you and God and His Word and His standards, but I'm just asking you this question because the church goes outside these walls, and all too often we think, well, if I'm on my own, I'm on the other side of the planet, on the other side of the country, in another state. We think, well, I've got my own little world now. But this body of believers... If somebody sh suffers shame, we all suffer shame. They say, well, it's not your life. I'm sorry. When you joined yourself to Center Christian Church, you're now a part of our life. We share in that. We share in that, which means when you stumble, you are not alone, not only because Christ is with you, but because this body is here to comfort but it's also here to guide. We like some of the things about the church. We don't like the others. We don't like the guiding and rebuking part of the church. That rebuking and that guiding is to be done in love, but it is to be done. Because this discipleship is about these relationships. And, I, and we talked about here as we were getting ready for the Christmas program, you know, I said, well, I, I want us to remember it is just as important for the Christmas program as an example that the relationships that are built while we're doing this, we don't cross boundaries in, in, in anger or frustration in those relationships, even if it's behind the scenes and nobody sees it on Christmas morning. Relationships are more valuable than any program or play we do here at this church. Any event that we plan, yeah, that's easy to say, and absolutely you're right, it's not easy to do. You know, my mom shared an example of uh, when uh, my dad and her were working with a church up in the Kentucky area while they were at Johnson Bible College back in the day. And at one point, uh, as it will go, the Sunday morning gets frustrating and you're not finding what you need to do. You're starting to run late and there's tensions are running high. And uh, my dad, he said, uh, uh, well, if, if uh, you can't do this class in the right attitude, we're not doing the class today. He said, do, do, you think, do you think it's right for you to go into the class with these tensions, this attitude? And she said, well, you know, first she's like, well, what is your problem, you know? But the truth there is that we've got to be right with the relationships we have with each other or else discipleship just won't work. And he said, well, Mike, as long as you're speaking the truth of God's word, it really doesn't matter. No, he said, he said if you can't show love if you can't show this love that Christ, if you say you love me, but you don't love your brother, you're a liar. Oh, that was inconvenient. I just want us to think about it this week. Verse 27 again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look back there at the last verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of of it. Your individual personal life ties in with this family in good ways and sometimes in inconvenient ways for you. There's days you days you and I am so blessed to be a part of this church and other days you go, I just wish they'd stay out of my business. I'm not talking about gossip. That is an issue. People trying to be part of a solution that's none of their business. Making up lies, spreading stories, stabbing you in the back. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when someone steps in and say, do you really think you ought to be saying that? Do you really think you ought to be doing that? They confront you one-on-one. -on -one. That's how it's supposed to be. Not, can you believe they're saying that? It's going over and saying, hey, can I talk to you in private? I, I was just wondering, is it true that you were saying this first? Ask that. Or, hey, I heard you say this. We need to talk about this. One-on-one. -on -one. One-on-one. 
It's messy. It's relationship. It's discipleship. Deal with it. It's God's design. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Unified to care. That's what we're here for. That's what discipleship is about. That's what Jesus demonstrated. And in times he had to give tough love to his disciples. At times he had to tell them things they didn't want to hear. But in the end he gave them hope, a way of restoration and redemption if they were willing to repent and follow him. That's the attitude we are to be reaching out with in discipleship is not, well, you've messed up. You're categorized now. Tough to be you. Instead, here's where you've gone wrong. Here's where we can walk right together. Always redemption, always solution, always hope, and you always take the responsibility to disciple that person. If God brings it to your attention, it's very likely He wants you to walk in discipleship with that person. Now, I asked you in the beginning, who are you discipling? Now, who do you want to disciple? I've asked you who you are discipling because, as a church, we're all called to do that. This is not hypothetical. And if you're struggling to think of somebody specifically you're working with and walking with, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to, they don't have to be your age. The Bible gives a structure of mentorship that comes from elders to youngers. And, and the youngers and the olders both are both sharing in some responsibility for creating that space and that age gap. We're a multi-generational family church. Let's keep those gaps closed. Let's communicate with each other. Let's be willing to spend time with each other and just talk and just share, hear each other's stories, and then encourage each other for the next step in the Lord. Edification of the body. Discipleship. It's relationship. It's bigger than this building. They can all be accomplished in God's strength. Pray with me tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for the the visualizations you gave out of Psalm chapter 8, Lord, that you're Lord over this universe and so mighty and majestic, and yet you give your truths through the mouths of little children. You've chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Lord, tonight we... We love our church family and we appreciate the resources of this building, but we take our camera lens and we zoom way out. We zoom way out into the universe and get a scope of just how majestic you are beyond these church walls. And then we zoom back in. Zoom back in with all that awe and that wonder. And we unify around you. And then we come back into this church and look for ways to go back out with that majesty and that hope and that redemption and that truth and your word. And we look to be agents of yours. Dealing with some of those messy relationships so that we can be faithful in discipleship. We thank you and praise you for the discipleship that is already occurring that I know about here at this church. And for the new boundaries we're going to break through to be known as a church who truly helps in saving the lost and discipling the saved. We thank you and praise you for what you've done with this church and what you're going to continue to do in the days to come. In Jesus' name.